Hey, good morning, Pastor Connor here at 7.30 on uh, September 8th. Thanks so much for being with me this morning to join me for a time of prayer, of reflection, uh, time in the Word. So glad you could be with me. If you're here live, wonderful. Uh, uh, praise God for the opportunity to be together. If you're joining me at a different time during the day, thank you. And just remember, even if you're joining me later on in the day and you want to leave a comment, uh, I always go back and just check to see if someone has a comment that uh, I need to respond to. I'm happy to do that. But you're always welcome to email, message, text, call, whatever. Uh, anytime, uh, you're all welcome to participate in whatever means works for you. So, okay. Today, what I want to do is spend a little bit of time in uh, Psalm 13. I'll get there in just a minute. And then my plan for the rest of the week, and we brought this up at some point last week. I can't remember exactly what day it was. We talked about the emotion of anger just briefly. I made reference to it. It wasn't our focus for last week. We just made reference to it. But I think it's such an important conversation to have. What do we do with anger? What does the Bible teach on anger? Um, um, that my plan is to spend, uh, if, I, if it all goes well, at least the next two days, maybe the next three, exploring uh, uh, what Scripture teaches on this because uh, there's some pretty surprising things in there and some pretty wise counsel, obviously, in Scripture regarding how we deal with anger. And we'll get to that later on in the week. So Psalm 13, I want to start just by reading the psalm. It's a very short psalm, but it's a powerful psalm. Now, it's a psalm of lament. We've talked about lament before, or the longer word lamentation. You have a whole book of the Bible called Lamentations. A lament is an expression of deep sorrow or grief or loss or pain or frustration or, or something. Let's put it this way. It's a recognition of some aspect of something being not right. There's a not rightness to your life, to this world, uh, and uh, pretty much in all things in creation, there's a sense of not rightness to it. And that comes from the reality of the fall, right? So uh, when we talk about the not rightness in our life, and we're expressing sorrow or grief or frustration over it, we are lamenting. David is expressing sorrow, lament, frustration, fear, anxiety, all of these things over a situation in his life. We don't know exactly what the situation is, but the psalm will make uh, allude to whatever it is. So we'll read through it, and then we're going to bring it into our own lives, okay? So Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Okay, lots in there and just a few short verses. I want to unpack this, okay? So the psalm starts off with this very poignant, powerful question. How long, O Lord? And he repeats that, see, one, two, three. Three, four times, he asked the question, how long? Now, the, the impact of that statement is, how long will you refrain from taking action for me? Now, that's a pretty powerful uh, uh, question, right? And what I love about Scripture here is, it gives you the permission to ask God the same questions. Now, it's going to take us somewhere here in a minute with those questions. But Scripture gives you the permission to go to God, to pour out your heart. It even gives you the words to use. All right, this is a great image. We talked about this before. But children learn how to speak by listening to their parents and grandparents from the loving adults who give them the words to speak. Our relationship with the Lord is no different. He gives us the words to speak to him. And here in Psalm 13, we have words to speak in our grief, and our sorrow, in our pain, in our hurt, in our not rightness. How long? How long is it going to be like this? How long before you take action? Now, when it talks about this, will you forget me forever? Will you hide your face from me? Okay, 
in the Old Testament especially, but all scripture, when it talks about God remembering, like God says, I have remembered my covenant, or I have seen uh, the plight of my people. Remembering and seeing, when the Old Testament talks about remembering and seeing, and even the New Testament, that, that these were not talking about states of consciousness, that God just, oh yeah, I remembered because I forgot something, or oh, I just happened to look away and now I see it again. No, these were preludes to action. So these are action-oriented words. When God says, I remember, I see, it means God's going to do something. God's going to act. It doesn't mean, well, God got old and he just forgot something. No, God's getting ready to act. So when David says, will you forget me forever? Will you hide your face from me? You know, cover your eyes. That's the idea. In other words, how long will you refrain from acting for me? That's the impact of David's question. And I know you hear that and you think, can you ask that of God? Is that allowed? Is that okay? Well, it's in the Bible, right? God is giving you permission to take those questions to him, all right? Uh, so uh, David is expressing great turmoil in his, in his being. So in verse 2, he talks about how long must I take counsel in my soul? And you say, I'm not really sure what that means, take counsel in my soul. Well, here's a great insight. So often in Hebrew poetry, and you know it's poetry based upon the way it's, it's formatted in your Bible. It's always formatted in, in a poetic stanza sort of setting. Instead of the prose, uh, the straight up narrative is just, you know, um, margin to margin, and it's just solid text. But this is poetry, and Hebrew poetry functions in terms of parallelisms. Statement, restatement, statement, contrast, statement, complement. Well, here you have, how long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? Sorrow in my heart builds upon counsel in my soul. So whatever counsel in my soul means, it has a similar meaning of sorrow in my heart. It's a phrase that was common in that culture. We don't use it so much, but it has to do with being sorrowful, experiencing turmoil, anguish inside. So David is in great turmoil and anguish. That's the idea. Okay, he goes on and says, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Now, in that culture, there was this belief that the, the eyes didn't just receive light, but the eyes actually were a source of light. They actually produced light. So death darkened that light. That's the idea here that to, to light up my eyes means basically to enliven me with life lest I die. That's the idea that, that David is saying, okay? Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Well, David is struggling to persevere and he's worried that he will waver and his foes will exalt and gloat, making both David and the Lord look bad. David doesn't want that to happen. So he's asking the Lord to help. Now, here's where the psalm has been headed all along. And this is, this is so exciting and so important. I want you to, to appreciate this, okay? David says in verse 5, But I have trusted in your steadfast love. Huge, huge word in the Bible. I mean, this is getting to the essence and nature of God himself. So back in Exodus chapter 34, God has hidden Moses in the cleft of the rock and God passes in front of him. And he says this, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Abounding in steadfast love. If you just did a search for, if you like, in the ESV, they always rend the English Standard Version, the translation of the Bible, they render this Hebrew word as steadfast love. So if you just were to look for, just do a concordance search for steadfast love, it shows up over a hundred times in the Psalms. It shows up hundreds of times, hundreds of times in the Old Testament. Because this is the heart of God. This is the nature. This is what, this is what the psalmists and the prophets were always telling people, Cling to this. Even if you experience hard things, sorrow, loss, pain, some sense of not rightness in your life, you always run to and you cling to that you know your God is a God of steadfast love. It doesn't change. It doesn't go away. 
no matter what the circumstances, this doesn't change. Now, this also, Old Testament speaking, this was a covenant term, right? I mentioned Moses is in the cleft of the rock. God is passing by. He's revealing his nature to Moses. Well, what's happening in that, in that scene, in that whole narrative? God is making a covenant with his people. He is bringing them out of Egypt. He's giving them the promised land. God is keeping his promise. So kesed, which is the Hebrew word for steadfast love, kesed, steadfast love, this is the covenant promise of the Lord. So no matter what else is happening in your life, this doesn't change. The steadfast love of the Lord doesn't go away. Okay, and, and you see this, like I said, the prophets and the priests and the, the psalmists, they were always pointing people back to God's steadfast love. So we talked about this last week, and here's what I said last week. God is a God of steadfast love, a steadfast love that we see clearly in the cross and empty tomb of Jesus. Because God has an always and forever, never giving up, love you to the cross, into the grave, and out kind of love. That's God's steadfast love. So we see God's steadfast love in action in the cross of Jesus. Now, here's what's really exciting. The next phrase in the psalm actually takes us to Jesus. Here's what it says. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Okay, pop quiz. What does the name Jesus mean? What does the name Jesus mean? It means the Lord is salvation. The Lord saves. Here's how. In Hebrew, the Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua. When you take that into Greek, it's Jesus. When you take it into English, it's Jesus. You can actually render this, my heart shall rejoice in your Jesus. My heart shall rejoice in your Jesus because that's where we find God's steadfast love in action, uh, in existence, in place, there for us. So no matter what not rightness you experience in your life, whatever lament you need to bring to the Lord, and there are many. You have yours, we have ours, right? There are many. But the steadfast love of the Lord doesn't change and doesn't go away. And David says, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. So the Lord has dealt bountifully with us in Jesus, in giving us the kingdom, right? I mean, Paul says in Ephesians 3, I think this is a great place to kind of wrap this up. He says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. See, God deals bountifully with you in Jesus. He gives you the kingdom. He gives you salvation, forgiveness, grace, eternal life, the promise of resurrection, renewal, and reunion you with, with those you love who have died in the faith. This is all yours in Jesus. So no matter what not rightness you experience, and each of you can tell stories of how you've experienced your own not rightness, no matter what it is, the steadfast love of the Lord never changes. It never goes away because nothing can take Jesus off that cross or put him back in that tomb. That stands for you today, tomorrow, forever. God has dealt bountifully with you in Jesus. Okay, so much uh, in that psalm to appreciate. Hope you appreciate this. The few minutes we had to run through it, but let's take a moment to pray. Lord God, we are often racked by sorrow and defeat. We experience hard things in our families. We receive difficult diagnoses. We see friends turn their back on us in our time of need. And we hurt. Sometimes we hurt in the deep down places. With David we cry out, How long, O Lord? How long until you take action for us? But like David, we have trusted in your steadfast love. Your steadfast love that we have seen clearly in Christ's cross and empty tomb. So despite our hurt, Despite our pain, our hearts rejoice in your salvation. Our hearts rejoice in your Jesus. In Jesus, you most surely have dealt bountifully with us, atoning for our sins, giving us grace, and assuring us of an eternal kingdom free from sin, sorrow, and death, an eternal kingdom characterized by life, joy, and righteousness. So while we hurt, we do so in faith, with eyes fixed firmly on Jesus, because of Jesus, we know that you have not abandoned us in our time of need. And because of Jesus, we know that you will act for our ultimate and eternal good. 
So teach our hearts to sing, even in our grief, hurt, and sorrow. We ask that you grant our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thanks so much for taking a few minutes to be with me today. Be sure to share this with others so they can be in prayer and reflection. And I'll be back tomorrow at 730. Thanks.